Welcome back, Chappelle. Welcome back to it. Welcome back to your flip classroom and our continuing discussion of imperialism during the late 1800s. I right, Pierre, I love you too. Now, the big thing about it, though, when we're talking about this, is we've been discussing, you're messing it all up. Like, so we've been discussing the growth of imperialism during the late 1800s. He has a very, like, little bit of an ill belly today, so he doesn't feel good. He's very clingy. Now, like, the biggest thing about it, though, is, is what we're talking about now is we're continuing our discussion about the growth of imperialism during the late 1800s. Now, in class, I'm recording this flip really, really early, but in class, what we should have actually recently talked about is, of course, I know you don't feel good, is, of course, we were talking about the effects of British imperialism on British society, right? So the biggest thing about it is we were discussing the Sepoy mutiny, right? We were discussing the forced, uh, forced Christian laws onto Buddhist and Hindu like populations. We were discussing, uh, oh, the fact that they like re-solidified the caste system to try and use it as a census system in, like, in India, right? When the British are actually just kind of really, really getting out of line. They banned this thing called Sati, and a lot of this was actually to try and just make themselves look good. But the thing about it that we're now moving on to is we're now going to talk about the large-scale imperial activities of Europeans in relation to their effects on Africa, right? So look right here real quick. We're changing up our title again. We're now moving into the Europeans in Africa, right? So the biggest thing that we have to discuss is the fact that, number one, the Europeans have been in Africa for quite some time, right? The Europeans have actually been there setting up several different systems, including the slave trade system that actually happened on the western coast of Africa going back as soon as the 1500s, set up by the Portuguese. We talked about also how they were actually trying to navigate around Africa, trying to get past the Cape of Good Hope, and also get to Indian spices. So Europeans have been there for quite some time. But the thing about it is that they want to now explore the parts of Africa that they've never actually charted, right? Now, if you look at this map of Africa during, I believe this is around 1870-ish, right? So this is actually where European spheres of influence were in Africa and contact in Africa. Look at it all being around the coastline. Well, Africa is going to, going to, going to go from looking like that to looking like this, right? Having all of its lands claimed by European powers and things like that. Reason why is because the Europeans want to actually discover and like not discover because people already live there, want to try and explore and take over the interior of Africa, right? And they're going to use a lot of disgusting and nefarious tactics to do so, right? So going into it, the interior was believed to be full of raw materials. They believed that things like petroleum, diamonds, gold, things like that were going to be inside the interior of Africa. Now, they didn't find as many precious metals as they thought they would. They didn't find a lot of diamonds in South Africa, but the interior interior of Africa is going to be home to a lot of things like palm oil, rubber, and other kind of naturally occurring substances as well. Now, a quick review. If Europeans had been in Africa since the 1500s, why are they only exploring the 1800, or only exploring the interior during the 1800s now? Like, why is it taking them so long? A lot of it has to do with that quinine medicine, right? With their new technologies, Europeans now have the ability to explore the interior of Africa and not die from malaria, right? So the biggest thing when we're looking at it is we're now talking about the aspects of European growth because their imperialist colonies, go ahead, buddy. Um, their imperialist colonies are growing now because they have quinine medicine to kind of try and prevent the growth of the malarial diseases that will kill the explorers. And they also have things like steamboats and stuff like that that actually have a low birth, which means that they will actually be able to navigate some larger rivers. So the thing about it, though, also is, is that they're going in there with military technologies that will make them 100% unstoppable, which is absolutely terrible terrifying and absolutely disgusting. Now, the thing about it, though, is after several different explorers actually went into Africa, you got people like David Livingstone, you got Cecil Rhodes, you also have people like Henry Morton Stanley, these other people that are going to actually start navigating some of these rivers after the advent of quinine medicine and start trying to find places like the source of the Congo, and then also trying to actually spread missionary things and things like that, are going to start kind of pushing their way into Africa. There's going to be this thing known as a scramble for Africa. When Europeans realize that they actually can navigate these different rivers and actually go in there and find resources like ivory, rubber, palm oil, petroleum, different elements of like uh, different uh, raw material elements like that, it's going to lead to what's known as that scramble for Africa, right? Now, scrambling as in like a race, okay? Like as in they are trying to see if they can get what they can get to, what lands they can claim for their own countries and things like that by this time. This phrase that refers to the late 1800s race for African territory is often known as the scramble for Africa. Now, by the 1884, to try and prevent things from getting out of hand and trying to prevent war from actually going on over land that they don't even own, which is ridiculous to even say, you know what I mean? Like, that Europeans got together and had a meeting so they didn't go to war over land that they were 
unlawfully stealing from other people, right? In 1884, the Berlin Conference would be held, right? Which was a meeting in Berlin, which was the capital of the German Empire, to split up the territory in Africa, and not a single African person was actually invited, right? Now, the man who led that conference is none other than Otto von Bismarck, right? Otto von Bismarck can be seen right here actually splitting up this cake, which of course is labeled Africa, right? With other Europeans around the table. By 1904, the entire continent of Africa was going to be owned completely by Europeans. Now, something else that we need to understand really, really quickly is that the Europeans that are arriving in these different areas by this point are actually coming in with military technology that Africans had no ability to stop. And the people that they're actually taking over are tribal society Africans. Sub-Sahelian Africans during this time period were still tribal in setup, right? Many of them didn't have written languages. Many of them actually like kind of like operated much more on traditional values. And like also some, some were even at the time still semi nomadic right so the thing about it is is like much like the native americans in like the united states this land would be taken from them using a lot of nefarious tactics but none oh no situation was nearly as bad as the belgian conquest of the congo right so this right here is a man by the name of leopold ii okay leopold ii to central africans is considered the worst human being in history right leopold ii was the king of belgium he was a constitutional monarch he didn't like the fact that he didn't have complete overarching power, right? So he wanted to try and get in on what was going on in Europe, and he wanted to try and claim some more territory for himself, right? And so he eyed up one central little spot in the area in the middle of Africa right here. It's this yellow chunk right there. That's what King Leopold wanted, and it's known as the Congo, right? He actually sent Henry Morton Stanley, an explorer, to go and explore this area to try and find the source of the Congo River. The Congo River is a very wide, large thoroughfare that he, they could use to actually put boats up and down, put railroads around it and stuff like that. Well, that's what Leopold wanted. And so he actually went to this Berlin conference meeting and he actually got that area, right? Now, what he's going to do is usher in a reign of terror like no other. So, well, literally what it was called. So whenever he went there, the original resource that he wanted was ivory, right? Because it was worth a lot of money. And then a, a later on, that's going to change in the late 1800s and the Belgians are going to start trying to like harvest rubber from there as much as possible. Now, the thing about it is, though, is that literally this rule, Leopold's rule in Central Africa, in the Congo, would actually lead to the death of 10 million people. Africans, right? 10 million people over the course of the Belgian conquest of the Congo. And it was in disgusting manners, right? He would for like apparently his forces would make other like tribal Africans harvest rubber by taking their family members hostage. They also created an indirect military force known as the Force Publique where they recruited other Africans to actually suppress other Africans by giving them guns and weapons to try and force the other Africans to go off and actually farm and harvest this rubber as well. Well, now the crazy screwed up part about it and the symbol that very is very well known about this like Belgian conquest of the Congo is that every time a force public like soldier would fire a weapon they would have a spent cartridge right or cartridge that showed that they had shot a weapon and then what in gotcha and then so what ended up happening is literally the force public soldiers would have to bring back proof that they shot a human with it that they didn't actually shoot an animal with it so oftentimes what would happen in the Belgian conquest of the Congo is the force public soldiers would harvest hands from other living human beings to try and show that they actually had like shot a person, not an animal. But the thing about it is more often they were shooting animals because they're sub-Sahelian Africans that were raised in tribal societies. They wanted to use those guns to hunt, not actually suppress people and stuff like that. So you have to understand that the Belgian conquest of the Congo is actually considered something on genocide levels, okay? So the thing about it when we're looking at it, you have to understand that the scramble for Africa and that example right there just demonstrates to us that there are going to be massive societal effects of imperialism. Do you see what I'm talking about right here? Look at what I'm zooming in on right now. Focusing on these societal effects of imperialism, we just talked about one, right? When the Belgians went into the Congo and destroyed this entire thing, genocide is a societal effect of imperialism, right? Also, when you're looking at societal effects, racism is going to be a massive societal effect as well. So growing in or going into this understanding, these are very important that you understand, right? Because the major effects of imperialism are going to be wide-spanning, 
widespreading and are going to be very important. And I'm also going to be heavily testing you on them, right? So looking at this entire thing, revolts against European rule, of course, are actually going to happen. When we look at things like the Belgian conquest of the Congo as our example, by the way, really interesting little fact is that some people in Africa will actually name their children Adolf after Hitler because they've heard of a person that's taken over most of Europe and done all these things. And they think it sounds like a strong name, but the one name that nobody will ever name their child in Africa is Leopold because he's considered the level of Hitler to Africans as the level that the name Adolf is to people in Europe, right? So the thing about it though is, is revolts against European rule are going to happen, right? When you are taking over people and stripping their land and resources from them unlawfully, revolts are going to happen against European rule. We talked about this a little bit in class as well when we reviewed in our warm-up. We talked about the Taiping Rebellion in China. We talked about actually the, uh, the Sepoy Mutiny in India. There's going to be some in Africa as well that go down. And one particular instance was literally known when five 5,000 Africans, 5,000 Sub-Saharan Africans made up of a conglomeration of Zulu tribesmen and other people are going to try to actually take over a military installation being held by 50 British guys and four Maxim guns. And every, like not a single one of those 50 British men died. Four Maxim guns were all they needed to suppress a group of 5,000 Africans. So what does that demonstrate to us? that the tribes and the groups of people that were taken over by the Europeans in the late 1800s had no ability to stop this movement. And then also what you're going to see as well is religions and social structures are going to fall apart. You're also going to see the growth of this thing known as paternalism and racism. Paternalism is a very racist ideology that actually popped up in the late 1800s where basically Europeans believed that they knew better of what these people needed than they actually themselves knew, right? So it's taking a paternalistic view, viewing them as if they are children and stuff like that that needed British or that needed European guidance at this point right and you can see the growth of paternalism and racism in two key examples that I have listed right here one is actually a story that was written by a man named Rudyard Kipling now Rudyard Kipling wrote this poem called the white man's burden which is an example of paternalism. Now, this is a disgusting phrase, and I hate saying it, but this British guy basically wrote a poem saying, oh, it is the burden of Europeans to try and socialize and civilize people in other areas. That is absolutely ridiculous. It's flat out not true, and it's absolutely racist and insane, right? So, like, but that poem is very, very well known by the man who wrote, like, or by the man who wrote it, Rudyard Kipling. That guy also wrote another very famous book book as well, The Jungle Book, which in where he implies that Indian people are closer to animals than they are closer to human beings. That's why Mowgli can talk to them. So like going into it as well, social Darwinism is also going to be a massive reaction to this as well. Now for those of you who are in biology you should know what this is already. Darwinism is the idea of evolution. The strongest will survive and things like that, which came out in the late 1800s as well. Charles Darwin published his book called The Origin of Species, right? And in The Origin of Species, he talks about natural evolution, the like strongest will survive and stuff like that, which we now accept as scientific fact. But then he later on wrote another book, called The Descent of Man, right? Like, so in The Descent of Man, he talks about how he believed that Europeans were the most advanced race of human beings, which is ridiculous. And basically his ideas are going to be twisted and social Darwinism will then be used to say, basically, that Europeans had the right to take these places over because they were more advanced, which is stupid, ignorant, and dumb, all right? So the biggest thing about it is, is that is where we're going to be wrapping everything up with this flip. I'll see y'all soon. Y'all have a good one.